Hello and welcome. I'm Louise Shaner, Policy Director of the Hutchins Center on Fiscal Monetary Policy here at Brookings, where our mission is to improve the quality and public understanding of fiscal and monetary policy. It is my great pleasure to welcome Federal Reserve Governor Lael Brainerd this morning, who will be talking about the impact of fiscal policy on monetary policy, a topic right in the Hutchins Center's sweet spot and a subject of immense importance at this particular moment. Lil and I were classmates at, in graduate school at Harvard, and it was pretty clear even at the time that she was gonna be someone of great influence and she did not disappoint. Lil served in the Clinton White House working on international economic issues. After her time here at Brookings, she was Treasury Undersecretary for International Affairs in the Obama administration, at the time the highest ranking woman in the history of the Treasury Department. And she joined the Board of Governors in 2014. Following Lil's remarks, she'll be joined on stage by Don Cohn, former Vice Chair of the Federal Reserve, and currently a Senior Fellow here at Brookings, so that we can have a bit more discussion about these important issues, and then there'll be time for audience Q&A. So please join me in giving Lil a hearty welcome. Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you very much to Louise for the kind introduction, uh, for getting me through graduate school, and uh, I can't think of a better place really to be talking about monetary policy uh, and its relationship to fiscal policy than Brookings. There's been substantial speculation of late about significant changes to fiscal policy, although the magnitude, composition, and timing are as yet unknown, and will depend on the incoming administration and the new Congress, as well as the vicissitudes of the budgeting process. Even once any changes are enacted, uncertainty will remain about their effects on the economy. It thus seems possible that monetary policy could be affected for some time by uncertainty surrounding fiscal policy and its effects. Before I turn to the possible effects of fiscal policy, it's helpful to underscore the immense uncertainty that accompanies any attempt to forecast future economic developments. By statute, the Federal Reserve conducts monetary policy to promote the long-run goals of maximum employment and stable prices, which the FOMC has defined as 2% inflation. Uncertainty about future employment and inflation naturally translates into uncertainty about the path of future monetary policy. One useful measure of that kind of uncertainty is the magnitude of forecast errors. Over the past 30 years, outside forecasts of the unemployment rate, four quarters ahead, for instance, have missed the actual unemployment rate by more than three quarter percentage point in either direction, one third of the time. It shouldn't come as any surprise then that the associated forecasts of interest rates have a similar track record. Among the many factors that can affect the aggregate economy, a possible shift in fiscal policy has attracted the attention of both economic forecasters and market participants. Among forecasters surveyed by blue chip economic indicators for 2017, 44% indicated they had raised their forecast of inflation and 47% had raised their forecast of gross domestic product growth because of the US election results, although on average their forecast changes were relatively modest. In thinking about fiscal scenarios, forecasters have several historical episodes on which to draw. For example, following the 1980 elections, tax cuts were enacted and defense spending rose. Federal fiscal deficits adjusted for the cyclical state of the economy increased by roughly two and a half percentage points of GDP from the period before the elections to six years following the elections. Federal debt held by the public increased from about 25% of GDP to about 40%, and the current account deficit widened. Following the 2000 election, similar fiscal changes resulted in an increase in the fiscal deficit close to three percentage points of GDP over the first six years of the new administration, again on a cyclically adjusted basis. Of course, there are very important differences in today's conditions relative to these historical settings, including the economy's cyclical position, current and projected levels of indebtedness, the relative position of the global economy, and monetary policy settings. As of today, there's substantial uncertainty about the possible changes in the stance of fiscal policy. In addition to the critical magnitude and timing issues, there are four key dimensions along which the effects of fiscal policy might vary. The composition of policy changes and their relative effects on aggregate demand and aggregate supply 
the distance of our economy from full employment and 2% inflation, the divergence in the cyclical position of the United States relative to our foreign partners, and the amount of fiscal space. Different types of policies can have very different implications depending on the aggregate economic stimulus per fiscal dollar spent. Generally, fiscal stimulus that expands spending and investment directly or is targeted to households and businesses that have the greatest propensity to spend rather than save can be expected to generate the largest response in aggregate demand. It also depends whether the effect is predominantly to raise aggregate demand alone or also to expand the supply potential of the economy. Focusing first on those policies that affect predominantly or only aggregate demand, temporary demand-based fiscal expansions can speed recovery when the economy is some distance from full employment and target inflation, particularly if conventional monetary policy is constrained by the effect of lower bound. But when the economy is close to or at full employment and inflation is converging to its target, additional fiscal demand will more likely result in inflationary pressures. Thus, fiscal expansions that affect only aggregate demand and are enacted when the economy is near full employment and 2% inflation are relatively less likely to sustainably boost economic activity and relatively more likely to be accompanied by increases in interest rates. Adjusting for inflation... Most estimates of the neutral rate, the rate that's consistent with output growing close to its potential rate with full employment and stable inflation, are currently close to zero, compared with about 2% in the decades prior to the crisis. A low neutral rate implies that conventional monetary policy has less room to respond when the economy is hit by adverse shocks, so it's more difficult for the economy to recover and inflation to move back to target. Policies that persistently raise aggregate demand alone can lift the neutral rate, but that may come at substantial cost. Because these policies do not affect the economy's long-term growth potential, but do result in persistent fiscal deficits, they can lead it to increases in the debt-to-GDP ratio. In that case, the greater space for monetary policy to respond to adverse shocks provided by a higher neutral rate comes at the expense of reducing the space for fiscal policy to stabilize the economy in the event of those adverse shocks. By contrast, changes in fiscal policy that raise productivity or induce greater labor force participation and higher levels of skill and education raise the nation's productive capacity and result in more sustainable increases in output and living standards. The higher productivity and workforce levels would likely increase investment opportunities and raise expectations of future income growth, sustainably boosting the levels of investment and consumption and, as a result, the longer-run neutral rate. Such policies are more likely to be sustainable because the boost to GDP they provide continues to accumulate over time, limiting increases in the debt-to-GDP ratio and preserving fiscal space. Third, the effects of fiscal policy depend importantly on the relative strength of the broader global economy. At a time when the U.S. economies made important progress on employment and inflation, both Europe and Japan uh, have output or inflation, or both, that remain well below desired levels. As a result, forecasters expect short-term yields in these economies to remain near zero for some time. Moreover, growth in many emerging market economies, including importantly China, has slowed in recent years and financial conditions in some appear fragile. With deficient demand abroad, if more expansionary fiscal policy here at home raises expectations of a growing divergence, upward pressure on the exchange rate will likely result, as we've seen recently with the renewed increase in the dollar. The result could be cross-border spillovers from the increase in U.S. domestic demand, reducing the effect on U.S. real activity and inflation, and potentially contributing to external imbalances. In the past few years, the effect on the dollar of increased expectations of divergence has been especially strong. The nearly 20% increase in the dollar over 2014 and 2015 coincided with falling real exports and import prices in the United States. Net exports subtracted more than one half percentage point from GDP growth in both 2014 and 15, while falling non oil import prices likely subtracted one quarter percentage point from the annual rate of core inflation. Finally, the trajectory of federal government debt relative to GDP and views regarding its sustainability can also 
influence the effects of fiscal policy. Research suggests that increases in the debt-to-GDP ratio cause long-term interest rates to rise. All else equal, higher long-term interest rates reduce spending on interest-sensitive goods, possibly damping the direct effect of fiscal expansion on economic activity. The experiences of foreign economies suggest the relationship between debt and interest rates is complex and likely nonlinear. In this light, it is notable that the current ratio of debt to GDP in the United States is substantially larger than it was preceding the fiscal expansions in the early 1980s and early 2000s, and has already been projected to increase further based on demographic trends. With any future change in fiscal policy quite uncertain, monetary policy will continue to be guided by the current state of the economy, the underlying momentum at activity and inflation, the level of the neutral rate, and the balance of risks. In recent quarters, the data have painted a consistent picture of a resilient and gently improving U.S. economy. Overall, I am pleased to see that full employment is within reach and could prove sustainable with the right policy mix. Payroll growth has remained sufficiently robust to continue eroding slack, increasingly along margins that had previously seemed stubbornly elevated, including the long-term unemployed, those on the margins of the labor force, and those who are working part-time but would prefer full-time work. Wage growth appears to be picking up gradually in a further sign that slack continues to be taken up. While the employment cost index was up only 2.3% over the 12 months ending in September, still well below pre-crisis norms, average hourly earnings have accelerated more noticeably recently, increasing by 2.9% on a 12-month basis. Even so, some slack may remain in the still low level of the prime age employment to population ratio and still elevated share of employees working part-time who prefer full-time. Following a long period of stubbornly below target inflation, I've also been encouraged by recent signs of gradual progress toward our inflation target as the effects of earlier dollar appreciation and oil price declines appear to be waning. Over the 12-month period ending in November, core personal consumption expenditures prices increased 1.6%. This is still noticeably below our 2% target, but it's up one quarter percentage point from a year earlier. In addition, and importantly, market measures of longer-run inflation compensation have improved about 40 basis points recently relative to the very depressed levels prevailing through much of the preceding year. Although even with this increase, inflation compensation remains below historical norms. How quickly remaining slack is utilized and inflation returns to target depends on future growth in activity. Real GDP appears to have increased by about 2% last year, the same pace as the year before. Consumer spending has been relatively robust, rising at a more than 3% annual rate in the three months ending in November, but business fixed investment has been notably sluggish, increasing only 1.5% in the third quarter and has changed little on net since the middle of 2014. However, measures of sentiment, both business and consumer, have moved up noticeably recently, potentially signaling a stronger pace of investment and consumer spending ahead. Changes in financial conditions have been somewhat offsetting since early November, with equity prices rising 7%, while 10-year Treasury yields are up 50 basis points and the dollar's up 4%. Based on these recent spending indicators, we might expect progress to continue to be gradual and steady. However, if fiscal policy or other changes lead to a more rapid elimination of slack, policy adjustment would, all else being equal, likely be more rapid than otherwise. With the conditions the FOMC has set for a cessation of reinvestments of principal payments on existing securities holdings being met sooner than they otherwise would have been. When the economy eventually returns to full employment and 2% inflation, the appropriate level of the federal funds rate will depend on the level of the neutral rate, which is expected to move up only modestly in coming years from its current low level. On the one hand, if progress on employment and inflation occurs more quickly than I anticipate, foreign risks recede and the fiscal impulse rises, the neutral rate might rise more rapidly. On the other hand, global conditions may somewhat offset the effect on the neutral rate with weak domestic demand abroad, further tightening of financial conditions through the exchange rate could lead to spillover of demand across borders weighing on U.S. exports, investment, and manufacturing activity, and potentially constraining the neutral rate. Finally, how strongly monetary policy should react to signs of further progress depends on the balance of risks. Given the recent improvement in unemployment, 
and inflation and the possibility of increased fiscal stimulus, risks in the domestic economy are closer to being balanced than they have been for some time. With the economy getting closer to full employment, the prospect of material fiscal stimulus over a sustained period could reasonably be expected to shift somewhat greater probability towards stronger inflation outcomes. But risks outside our borders are still tilted to the downside. In particular, despite recent progress, policy space in Japan and the euro area is perceived to be very limited, and the euro area banking sector remains somewhat fragile. Downside risks are also present in emerging market economies such as China. With a low U.S. neutral rate, conventional U.S. monetary policy doesn't have as much room as previously to counter such adverse shocks from abroad. So in summary, uh, one could anticipate uh, that with current conditions continuing, uh, that um, the uh, adjustment of monetary policy will likely to be gradual uh, as we approach our goals of full employment and 2% inflation. But the prospect of materially greater fiscal could potentially uh, lead uh, to adjustments in that path, which will, of course, remain uh, data dependent. Thank you very much. Okay, so well, let me just follow up a little bit on what on what you said. So you said that you thought the eco the economy was closer to being balanced. So um, I think that most of the FOMC participants would probably say that the labor market is now near the Fed's maximum employment goal, or maybe even a little bit beyond it. Uh, and Chair Yellen noted at the press conference that this might not be the best time for fiscal stimulus. So two questions: one, do you think that the economy is now around full employment, um, and and if so, why? And two given the answer to the first, what do, you, do you think that a fiscal stimulus bill really is quite risky now? So um, I think the economy has made uh, really nice progress uh, over the last uh, year towards full employment. Uh, obviously, there is some uncertainty uh, surrounding exactly what the level of full employment is, particularly post-crisis. What we saw over the last year was that for uh, about a year, the unemployment rate actually held steady while we saw uh, improvements in the labor force participation rate, which many economists hadn't anticipated uh, given uh, underlying demographic trends. So I think uh, what we've seen uh, in recent months is continued uh, more gradual but still relatively robust payroll growth, which has resulted in a reduction in the unemployment rate and uh, more modest gains on labor force participation. As I said earlier, um, labor force participation among prime age uh, workers is still one and a half percentage points below where it was pre-crisis, and so we don't really know uh, exactly how much of that represents additional slack. Similarly, there's a still uh, notably elevated uh, number of people working part-time who uh, prefer to work full-time. How much of that is structural, I don't think we know. So I think we are uh, approaching uh, full employment, and again, I think that with the right mix of policies, uh, we can uh, both attain it and expect to sustain it over time. Um, and uh, the where fiscal policy, I think, fits in that mix, uh, again, to the extent that we uh, saw fiscal policy that sustainably improved the supply side of the economy, lifted potential. Um, that would uh, provide a more sustainable uh, policy mix uh, in these circumstances. How about you, Don? Do you think that there's as much slack, um, or do you think that the 
the FOMC has gotten behind the curve a little bit. So I would uh, pick up maybe on, a, I think, a very important theme that Leo had, which is uncertainty. And I mean, the truth is we don't know. And uh, I, 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 I don't like I don't like it when people give very precise, and Lael hasn't done this, but uh, some do, very precise estimates of the Nehru and where full employment is, a little below or a little below. I think we're in the neighborhood of full employment. Lael might be right. There might be some more give without undue inflation pressures, but I do think uh, we're close and uh, might even be kind of there. And so it'd be really important to watch how that inflation evolves. Lael was absolutely correct that it's already come up about a quarter percentage point over the last year. The unemployment rate has dropped a couple tenths. Uh, wages are rising. So I think we're, we're pretty close. And the, we're in a situation in which we're in the neighborhood of full employment and the real federal funds rate is still pretty deeply negative about a point and a half, um, so or almost a point and a half. So I would say we've got, uh, even with a zero real, uh, a real uh, R star, real uh, sustainable int interest rate, we've still got a pretty accommodative policy for already being at full employment and inflation rising slowly but steadily towards the 2% target. Now, I think the Fed's been absolutely correct to be very cautious about raising rates when you're so close to the effective lower bound. You don't want to make the mistake of raising rates too rapidly and sending the economy back down again. Um, but I also think that absent some shock that no one's uh, ready for one way or another, it's probably going to be call for a somewhat steeper trajectory going forward than the once a year for the last two years. Let's talk about the difference between what the changes in the FOMC projections and the market reaction to the election. Um, so the market has reacted much more and rates have, market expectations of rates has changed a lot more than the SEP rates, the dots. Um, do you think that's because the market thinks there's going to be a bigger fiscal stimulus or uh, don't sort of think about the effects on the economy the same way the Fed, do, the Fed does? But I think it's interesting to see that the market implied path um, uh, in uh, recent weeks has moved um, actually quite uh, close now um, to the summary of economic projections, the SIP uh, dot pot uh, median uh, path. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, we, th there are differences between uh, those uh, two concepts. Um, most, I think, observers um, believe that uh, part of the reason, uh, or perhaps uh, a lot of the reason for the movement in the market implied path, um, is that uh, term premia have uh, increased after being uh, relatively uh, negative over the past, you know, over 2015 and 2016. And that may uh, be interpreted as uh, signaling uh, that uh, market participants are putting less weight on low inflation outcomes. And so uh, what's been interesting to note is that after a pretty uh, prolonged period of being uh, below uh, the SEP path, the market implied path has now moved up to where the SEP path is. Do you think they have built in a bigger fiscal stimulus? <laughs> well, I think it's interesting that the, the delta, yeah. that the market revision has been larger than the FOMC participants revision. Now, I think the FOMC participants themselves were of two minds about whether to build in fiscal stimulus, and approximately half of them did, and we don't know how much they built in, but half of them didn't, being too uncertain about what exactly to build in. So I think it's perhaps not a little surprising that the market, market participants, I think, have built in fiscal stimulus, FOMC participants not so clear, so maybe that's one reason why the differences are there. And the FOMC didn't really need to assume anything about fiscal stimulus in making its interest rate decision in December. I think that was entirely justified by where inflation and unemployment had gotten. It did need to, participants did need to assume something when they talked about the future path of policy, but I hope um, 
Lael's words about uncertainty about that path are taken to heart. And among the uncertainties that would influence it are the size and nature of the fiscal policy. So do you think that there was any political issue here, which is that you know, if the Fed had taken on a big fiscal stimulus or maybe the expected value of the fiscal stimulus um, and then decided that that meant that they had to raise their projected path, that that might have looked like the Fed deciding to tell the new administration, well, you think you're going to raise fiscal stimulus, we're going to undo it. And given the political pressures on the Fed, do you think that was even a consideration in people writing down their paths? So I can only uh, speak uh, for myself. Obviously, we uh, each uh, develop our own uh, set path based on considerations. Um, and as I tried to convey earlier in my remarks, um, at this juncture, uh, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty. The magnitude, the timing, the composition, the likely effects are all unknown. Uh, we'll know more uh, over time uh, as the new administration, uh, the Congress, um, start to go through the budgeting process. Um, so I think different um, members may well have taken it on board in different ways. Um, some perhaps in the baseline, uh, others uh, in terms of the balance of risk. And you know, we saw the discussion in the minutes about the staff forecast and how they took a bit on board uh, in the forecast. Um, so it varies, I think. Uh, in my own case, I think I do see the balance of risk, as I said earlier, having shifted and being more balanced than they have been in the domestic economy for some. So I, I don't think the Federal Reserve participants I, ho I don't think and I hope that they did not factor in political considerations. I think it's their job to make their best guess as to what's going to happen in the economy to explain how their monetary policy intersects with what they think is going to happen in the economy and how that will produce maximum employment and stable prices. And uh, I think it would be a serious problem if the people even thought the Federal Reserve was shading its forecast one way or another or its uh, interest rate expectations one way or another out of political considerations. I think it, particularly over the coming year when it's going to be so uncertain about what's happening and the politics may be quite volatile, I think it's absolutely critical that the Fed be an economic forecaster, not a political forecaster. There are a bunch of PhDs in economics sitting around that table. I don't think there are any PhDs in political science. And so I, <laughs> I, I think, I don't know, maybe there are, but I don't think so. Uh, uh, so I think they got to keep their eye on the economics and not worry about the intersection of their forecasts with the political process. So I understand. So you sort of the intersection of their forecast with the political process is fine, but you said two things that I sort of were at odds. One is they you think it's their best guess, but when there's so much uncertainty about what a fiscal package might be, and you see that half the participants didn't even put one in, that probably wasn't their best guess, right? So there's a question of what to do when there's just this tremendous uncertainty. They think probably something's going to happen, but you don't know what, you don't know when, and how do you deal with that in a forecast? I think in a best guess you might, as you like the staff did, put something in. How do you deal with that? Do you do you, would, are you sort of, let, let me do the forecast without it and then wait to see, or? Well, I think this is not the only source of uh, uncertainty. In fact, there are a tremendous number of sources of uncertainty. We have to take into account um, foreign risks. We have to take into account uh, the price of oil, which we've seen can make a tremendous impact, and sometimes in ways that uh, were not well anticipated uh, on the economy. <laughs> Um, there are a whole range. Uh, risk attitudes may change uh, a great deal, as we saw in the wake of the financial crisis and affect the forecast in ways uh, that are uncertain. So this is one of many sources of uncertainty, and um, both the staff in, in their forecast and also um, uh, individual members of the FOMC have to make their best judgment. Does it affect the balance of risks? Should I include it in my baseline? Um, and so you come down um, uh, in a different place uh, depending on how much information you have and uh, what kinds of uh, historical episodes you might have to draw on, for instance. So I don't think it's terribly different than other sources of uncertainty. 
um, where, again, each FOMC participant at each uh, meeting where they are uh, asked to make a SEP forecast or meetings where they're not but need to have a view about monetary policy uh, are, are doing the same kind of factoring in of many sources of uncertainty. Yeah, I think you're, I agree with Lael, you're asked to do the most likely outcome, kind of the modal outcome, the most likely thing you expect to happen. Mm -hmm. You have to make a whole bunch of assumptions there. But I also want to underline something Lael said. It may be about the risks around that mode. So how you respond in policy even to a modal forecast of what you think is the most likely thing might depend if you saw the risk skewed one side or another to reduce the risk to the economy, you might want to skew your policy response to one side or another. But it's very subtle and complicated. And what about, so you said they didn't really need to write down a fiscal policy response right now for their decision. Their decision wasn't going to be affected by it. But let's say, you know, things, things take a while. Like there's things that are proposed in Congress. It's not sure they're going to get through. It's not sure what's going to happen to the ACA. But there's, you know, things are starting to move. Um, how long do you have, right, because of monetary policy lags? At some point, you have to say, well, I don't know what's going to happen, but I have to sort of act preemptively because it looks like it might. And then what are those, how do you make those kinds of, then you really do have, the economists have to make political forecasts of what is going to be enacted. Um, and how do, you, how do you approach that? And what kind of timing do you think you have? Is that something you need to start thinking about right away? Or do you have a little bit of time now? Or? Well, it's certainly the case that every um, FOMC meeting, uh, you want to take into account all of the information that's available at the time. And as you say, uh, Louise, uh, monetary policy is inherently forward-looking because of the lags, which are variable and not well uh, known with any precision. Um, so we're always uh, updating our outlook um, and then um, assessing the appropriate path of monetary policy uh, based on that. Uh, there are some fiscal policies that uh, take a very long time um, to actually work through uh, the economy. Um, others, uh, you may see the effects of uh, much closer to enactment or even in anticipation. So uh, those kinds of considerations um, do uh, necessarily get taken into account. I would say the flip side of that um, is simply uh, that we have seen um, that uh, you know it has been a period where we've had a variety of disinflationary forces in the global economy, um, that demand has been very weak outside of our borders, that the monetary policy uh, adjustment path, the expected path, is relatively gradual. And so there is a, a lot of space for um, taking on board that kind of new information. Um, and I think uh, there's reason to think that um, as uh, additional policy um, is um, uh, take factored into the economy, um, that there's a lot of ability to absorb uh, that globally. Um, so, you know, I don't uh, see that um, we're going to see uh, a very large adjustments um, in in most uh, likely scenarios. Ethan, that's right. Yes, I think most most of these fiscal policies that are particularly that are being talked about uh, will phase in somewhat over time, and I think that'll give the Federal Reserve time to assess as they get closer and closer to passage. The uh, potential range of outcomes will start to narrow. They'll be able to assess it and and uh, build it into their policy. I think one of the a complicating factor is that the financial markets are forward looking. So the financial markets will tend to build in their expectations, as you've already noted, Louise, they probably have done so already about fiscal policy, whether supply or demand side, and that will in turn uh, feed back on the current economy. So that's another level of complication uh, even before the Fed acts or has to change the path or decides to change the path of its rates, the financial markets react and the Fed has to take account of their effect, financial conditions, uh, the near and longer term, medium term future. Yeah, so 
Besides the financial markets reaction, there's also been this sort of surge in optimism uh, by consumers and businesses since the election, what Larry Summers has called, you know, they're on a sugar high. Um, so you have to decide, I think, you know, when you look at this, you look at sentiment, you know, is it a sugar high or is this something that's kind of reflect, going to sort of persist? So how do you even do that kind of judgment and like how much did you take into account this higher sentiment in thinking about your projection? So the uh, boost in sentiment has been notable, both business sentiment and consumer sentiment. Um, and there are good reasons um, to think that uh, consumer spending uh, could uh, remain robust. Uh, jobs are more plentiful. Um, uh, wealth um, has increased uh, for many consumers. And after a long period of uncertain economic conditions, I think consumers are responding to um, better prospects, um, and you can see that in, in the kind of uh, detailed answers that they give to some of these. Uh, business sentiment similarly um, has improved, and there too, you know, we saw a very large uh, reaction led by uh, drilling and mining sector um, in the wake of the oil price declines, but really we've seen very depressed uh, business investment, uh, and so conditions there too are ripe for some improvement. And so, you know, the hope uh, there too is that the sentiment actually does uh, come along with some uh, improvement, some turnaround in, in business investment. But there too, um, you know, we uh, we can build a little bit of that into our forecast. But we're going to be um, focused on the data uh, bearing that out. So I think the, the evidence on these consumer uh, demand and the, uh, the Michigan, for example, survey is that it's not that tight. There's a broad uh, correlation and correlation, as I, as I remember, Louise, you probably remember better than I do, when there are very large changes in the consumer sentiment index that tends to be reflected to some extent, not a huge extent, in consumer demand. So I think we have seen basically the gradual improvement mm -hmm. that uh, Rail was talking about with a little push at the end. I don't know if that's enough to really change consumption, but I also think Rail's emphasis on investment and business sentiment is really important. But there again, you have, uh, and Rail did a great job in her talk, emphasizing they're both supply and demand side pieces to this. So you'd get an initial push in demand from investment and the capital deepening that would occur would gradually over time raise the, raise pro, the at least the level if not the rate of growth of productivity. So I think the Fed will be faced with weighing the supply and demand side and it would be great if we saw a pickup in business and mm -hmm. businesses were more uh, optimistic about the demand for their goods and services going forward and optimistic and perhaps anticipating uh, greater profits from lower marginal tax rates, a little less. Yeah, so let me ask you about a little bit more about the, the demand side versus the supply side. So when you go through the, the, the policies that are being discussed, you know, some of them would have potentially uh, supply side effects. Um, so we're thinking about, you know, corporate taxes, infrastructure. Um, they're not talking about education. But um, a question I have is um, how much does the timing of the expected boost to productivity matter? So if I thought, I would, let's say I did education spending that I thought was really wonderful and was going to have a long run effect on potential, but it was going to take a very, very long time versus maybe a corporate tax change that maybe would have more of an immediate impact, um, although the productivity effects might be very slow too. How does the timing of the demand side versus the supply side affect monetary policy response? So I think um, it is uh, probably the case that a lot of the kinds of um, policies one can think of that uh, would have that uh, effect on um, the supply side of the economy, potential growth, might take some time uh, to really get some traction uh, and to lift uh, the longer run neutral rate in particular. Um, and if you saw a, a shorter term boost uh, that really came in aggregate demand uh, and, and it wasn't as clear whether the longer run neutral rate was actually going to be boosted and whether you were going to see those longer run um, supply side effects, 
um, you know, you might actually see the shorter run neutral rate uh, rising above the long run uh, neutral rate for some period of time until yeah. that um, uh, became clearer. Now, again, um, what matters also is the extent to which uh, ultimately um, that supply side boost means that uh, your fiscal constraints uh, are uh, lessened so that you retain fiscal space. And, and you know, that, that would matter, I think, uh, importantly in terms of the timing of the longer run supply side impact versus the shorter run demand side. You go ahead. So I don't have much to add to what Lael said. I think the Fed's job, since I think they're in the neighborhood of full employment, give or take, the Fed's job is going to be to keep demand in line with potential. And it's going to be really hard. <laughs> Glad it's your job, not mine. And uh, uh, because of the points you, that you both made, that the increase in demand may even overshoot potential for a while. If there's a lot of investment, people get over-optimistic. Uh, potential comes along slowly. So it's, it's going to be tricky. But I think it's uh, really critical for the Federal Reserve to emphasize in its communication what it's trying to do and explain why it's making the choices it's making. And it's not going to be easy in this complex, complex environment. And we haven't even mentioned trade. Uh, I can understand why Lael doesn't want to get into it, and I don't blame her. But uh, <laughs> if we start seeing major tariffs imposed, mm -hmm. uh, that's going to raise prices, raise the cost of goods and services to uh, U.S. consumers and businesses, and at the same time could easily damp potential growth as, as U.S. businesses uh, lose or uh, in, have the protective tariff wall against competition. So I think open, competitive economies tend to be more innovative, more productive. So I think the, uh, the Fed's job would really be complicated if there were price level increases because tariffs were imposed on goods and services coming from particular countries or particular uh, companies. Right. So one of the things people are talking about a lot is the, the corporate tax with the border adjustments, uh, which isn't a tariff and which economists say would be offset completely by exchange rates. But I think there's a lot of uncertainty about that. So, you know, uh, we've been trying to figure out exactly what these border adjustments, work, how they work, and it's very complicated. You as the Fed, are, when they start to see data coming in, I would guess would have to figure out, you know, is this inflation starting, or is this a one-time adjustment in prices because they think the exchange rate won't offset, or it's a tariff in a one-time? How, how do you figure that out, and how do you react differently if it's a, a supply side versus demand side, you know, one-time effect from the supply side affecting prices? So I think um, the framework that I laid out earlier is a framework that would apply to any uh, combination of policies. I, you know, I wouldn't um, be able to get into any particulars. Um, again, there's a lot of uncertainty, um, and uh, it's early days. I think uh, our job uh, in terms of uh, thinking about monetary policy, you know, we've got a dual mandate. It's very clear. Uh, it's forward looking. Um, we would uh, have a same, similar kind of a set of assessments. Um, you know, how uh, much uh, bang you get for your fiscal buck, what's the timing, um, what is the relative aggregate demand versus. Um, potential uh, growth impacts, um, what's the uh, relative impact in terms of the U.S. Uh, position relative to the global economy and what kind of adjustment are you going to get in terms of demand uh, being uh, primarily um, here or spilling over across uh, borders, um, and you know, ultimately, what kind of effect is it going to have um, on fiscal space? Those are the same considerations that I would probably bring to uh, any combination uh, of policies from a monetary policy point of view. So I think central banks have pretty good practice of late in allowing price level adjustments that don't feed into inflation. And you can see this in um, central banks that have are countries where exchange rates have moved a lot so right after the crisis.
a good example where they had big inflation overshoots mm -hmm. but didn't react to that because the economy was weak. So I think they, a key here, so I, and, and value added tax changes in yeah. various countries, central banks have been able to look through them because they're, they're forward looking, as Lael was saying, you gotta look into the future. So if it's just a price level change, then that shouldn't in, uh, contribute to inflation with this one exception, and which is inflation expectations. So I think under that kind of situation, the Fed would have to be looking really, really hard at what was happening to inflation expectations because that, an, an increase in inflation expectations would get built into the inflation process. So uh, hopefully whatever happens, that would be kept under control. It'll be an important for the Federal Reserve to um, say that it's committed to its 2% inflation target, even though there's an overshoot for a short period of time, and hopefully those expectations would, get, would be anchored and the Fed wouldn't have to react to that. And does that get harder if you're sort of doing that kind of stuff at a time when inflation is rising anyhow? So like how, how much does you know, a, a one-time so, price shift affect it if, if you're already having inflation rising? Yeah, it makes it harder. Okay. All right, last question. So this is so some of the some of the policies you might imagine might have regional effects. For example, maybe a policy would help the Rust Belt but hurt high tech or something. Does that factor at all into monetary policy, thinking about differences in regional effects, or do you just have to sort of kind of smooth through the whole economy and it's a, it's a complicated uh, question. We um, benefit from having um, 12 uh, regional banks. It's a really unique feature of the U.S. system. Um, and as you know from the transcripts and, and the minutes and your own experiences, um, the uh, bank presidents, uh, as they're sitting around the FOMC table, have two jobs. One is, you know, they're making monetary policy for the nation. Um, so they're attentive to um, overall economic conditions and uh, overall where is the U.S. economy in terms of distance from our aggregate goals. But they also um, have a special uh, responsibility to um, gather views, gather economic intelligence from their region and bring those um, to the attention of other members of the FOMC. And that's been uh, tremendously valuable to us. Uh, we. For instance, there are parts of the economy that are much more affected uh, by the recent oil price declines, and having that kind of uh, granular information brought to the table was very important. Uh, similarly, even um, uh, within regions, different groups may be quite differentially affected, and though we are making uh, monetary policy for the nation as a whole, for the workforce as a whole, it's extremely important for us to understand if there are groups that are being left behind or communities that are not making as much progress. And so we do um, really benefit from having those kinds of regional differences and um, differences in groups being brought to the table. Ultimately, however, uh, we have to look at the aggregate data. That's our mandate and it is overall inflation and overall uh, full employment that we're targeting. Yeah. I completely agree. <laughs> with her last statement. I mean, it's, you've got one instrument, basically, yeah. or yeah. The, the short term interest rate, and it's aimed at maximum employment stable prices for the United States, and it's the United States economy that you're ultimately focused on, and all this regional information, which can be very uh, important to see early trends developing, to look beneath the data to see where things might be going, but it all feeds into a national forecast. So this is true about regional information, it's true about, uh, say, unemployment or wages by education, and all this kind of breakdown that the Fed does a lot of really feeds into a national forecast. Um, itself affected by what's going on in the rest of the world, to be sure, but the, the, the congressional mandate is about the United States. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, we're going to open the, up to the floor for questions. Please raise your hand. We have a mic coming around. Um, and uh, here, why don't you go first? And when, oh, oh, we have two mics. Great. Uh, and please tell us who you are, where you're from. Anirban Paul, independent uh, consultant. Two questions exploring second and third order effects of U.S. interest rates hikes. 
and their bounce back through EM in two mark two cases, say currency markets and capital outflows. So in 1994, the exchange rate, exchange stabilization fund w was used in 1994 uh, for the peso bailout. I remember a hue and cry, and so for contingency planning, did Congress foreclose or restrict the use of that in case there is an EM currency crisis? Secondly, on the outflow part, most of the outflow is probably going to be into the equity markets and very selected real estate markets. So in order to avoid a bubble and asset price inflation in those short of the blunt instrument of further rate hikes, which wouldn't solve the problem, are there non-interest rate remedies to, as a contingency planning? I didn't understand. Um, when you are talking, I think, about uh, macro prudential tools, do you mean with regard to the emerging markets experiencing outflows, or do you mean here in the United States? No, yeah, emergency, uh, emerging markets experiencing outflows, that capital headed to into the United States. So here. If we saw a surge here. Yes. Okay. You want to start? So I think that there are macro, there are regulatory and macro prudential tools that are potentially there to, uh, to deal with bubbles or asset price issues and fragilities that might be building up in the financial markets. My personal view, which I've voiced a number of times, is the U.S. doesn't have enough of those tools, and, it, and they are, their use is um, restricted to some extent because it has to flow through FSOC and for the banking system, we have a lot of, the, the Fed has a lot of tools to deal with that kind of thing. When it gets beyond the banking system, it's a little harder. But I think that's, that would be the right place to look. And um, lots of things intersect with the banking system, so you can use that. I don't know the answer to your first question on restriction use of the ESF. Maybe you do. So, um, well, I would say, first of all, that, um, you know, when I enumerated the risks in the global economy, of course, uh, one of the risks that I'm attentive to is the possibility uh, that uh, some emerging markets may be somewhat vulnerable, um, particularly those whose corporate sectors may have taken on foreign currency denominated uh, debt during this time period, um, and we did see uh, some of that that we might see some outflow pressures there and some challenges uh, dealing with that depending on the configuration of interest rates and the exchange rate. Um, so I think, I think that is a risk that we want to be attentive to. Um, with regard to the exchange stabilization uh, fund, there were some restrictions uh, that were imposed and later to some degree lifted, but that issue really sits um, with the Treasury Department in consultation with Congress. So it's not something that the Federal Reserve um, has uh, authorities. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, Don has spoken a lot to these issues. With regard to um, macroprudential um, tools within uh, for the U.S. economy for financial stability risks, we're obviously in a much better position um, than we were uh, prior to the crisis um, with a uh, much stronger set of both through the cycle uh, tools, but also some that can be adjusted, like the stress test, like the countercyclical buffer. Um, and, of course, the banking sector has got much, uh, much thicker capital buffers, much better management uh, of liquidity. What we don't have um, easily or readily available to us are borrower side restrictions, which are particularly um, relevant, uh, have been used in uh, other uh, countries, um, particularly in the real estate sector. And that's just not something that is in our, our present toolkit. Okay. Alice Brother. Thank you, Lael, for a very helpful speech and stimulating this very good conversation. Uh, I wanted to uh, raise the question of long-run fiscal policy and uh, the debt-to-GDP ratio. Uh, there was a time when a lot of economists, including the Federal Reserve economists, were uh, viewing with alarm uh, the rise in long-run uh, debt. Uh, now we've sort of gotten used to the the debt being uh, debt uh, held by the public being around 75 percent of uh, GDP, and you mentioned in passing uh, the uh, demographic effect of uh, likely to drive up uh, that ratio uh, in the future. Uh, but uh, current 
uh, well, near-term fiscal policy could have that effect too. If you had big spending increases coupled with uh, big uh, tax cuts that are very hard to <laughs> reverse, uh, you could have a rapid escalation in the projections for debt to GDP. Uh, and uh, we've it sort of dropped out of the conversation. I wanted to put it back in the conversation and see if you'd say a word about uh, how how worried the Fed might be about a big increase in long-run debt. Well, I think, um, obviously, um, this is an area that you have a huge amount of expertise on, so I, I will just uh, stay at the kind of uh, level of how do we, how would I think about it in the context of monetary policy. and. Um, so obviously, as we think about uh, any configuration of fiscal policy, it has to be against the backdrop of how much fiscal space do we have um, relative to previous uh, historical episodes where we might have seen uh, similar kinds of uh, fiscal expansions. And uh, as you know, um, we have a much uh, more elevated level of debt to GDP for demographic reasons, um, that is expected uh, to increase somewhat. Um, so as we think about um, potential configurations of fiscal policy, some of the important considerations would be how much bang do you get for your fiscal buck, how, how effective is fiscal policy, and how much um, additional space does it uh, create or leave by actually boosting uh, potential output. And so that's why that uh, issue of the extent to which fiscal policy actually um, sustainably boosts uh, potential makes a very material difference in terms of how uh, monetary uh, policy would likely adjust. Yeah. Tell us who you are, where you're from, please. Uh, Peter Doyle, I'm independent. Uh, there was a comment made that uh, it, it, comfort was drawn from the fact that there's strengthening in financial sector supervision since the crisis. But of course, that is in question now too, with talk of repeal or of reform of Dodd-Frank and other reforms. If there were to be reforms of that nature, substantive reforms, how would that affect the conduct of monetary policy going forward? Would you feel obliged to, so to speak, learn what some see as the lessons from the 2000s that monetary policy was too loose for too long in the context of a, of a weak financial supervisory system? Well, what I uh, can say um, is that um, we uh, all experienced a very deep and very damaging financial crisis. And I think um, some very important lessons have been learned from the financial crisis. Uh, moreover, um, you know, we are now eight years into a very substantial adjustment process uh, that uh, the largest, uh, the most systemic financial institutions have undergone, uh, in which they have uh, built uh, very substantial capital buffers based on their systemic uh, footprint. Uh, they have uh, developed uh, plans uh, so that they can be uh, uh, put through a resolution process in an orderly uh, manner. Liquidity management uh, is a very robust part of our supervisory framework now, and funding models have changed uh, in ways uh, that took the important lessons about uh, from the runs that we saw in the wholesale financial markets. Uh, money market reform has now taken place. Um, the derivatives markets are much more transparent. We have a lot more activity that's being central cleared. Having um, already seen very substantial changes of that nature, um, you know, it is likely um, that uh, many um, are not going to want to start from scratch again um, and start an, a new process. Uh, so it, it seems like there's tremendous benefit um, given how much um, reforms have already been uh, fully digested. Um, so I can't uh, speak to any possible changes. You know, we, we implement um, uh, the rules under our statutory mandates, um, and, you know, we have uh, substantially completed uh, that work. Um, but uh, my observation is simply that um, uh, 
those adjustments are really um, uh, well underway or, or near complete in many cases. So I'm less constrained. <laughs> uh, I, would, I, would, I would be concerned if there were a material uh, pullback in, in the important pieces of Dodd-Frank that, as Leo remarked earlier, greatly strengthened the financial system and gave the authorities tools to deal with emerging problems in a countercyclical way. So linking it to the previous questions on macroprudential regulation, I think <coughs> most monetary authorities, certainly the Federal Reserve and Janet Yellen has said that they look at uh, macro, monetary policy as a last line of defense against emerging bubbles and fragilities in the financial market and uh, the effects that might have on financial stability. They would much prefer to use regulatory macroprudential policy to deal with those. And I think if there's less of that, uh, if that's rolled back in any significant material way, if the orderly liquidation authority is gone, for example, and um, unless it's replaced by a really effective uh, bankruptcy regime that might actually work, unlike the Lehman Brothers example, um, I think I would, as it puts more pressure on Leo and her colleagues to deal with financial stability issues with monetary policy under more circumstances if the regulatory system can't deal with those. So I think it would... I mean, there are lots of changes that might be made that wouldn't do what I just said I feared, changes you could make around the edges and a number of things. But a real a material lessening of the, resu of the authority's ability to build resilience in the financial system, including in a countercyclical way, I think would put more pressure on the monetary authorities, and that, that would be a bad thing. Yeah. Do you agree? Monetary policy, last line of defense? You know, again, I, I think um, the, the world has changed substantially, um, and uh, it's very hard uh, to contemplate uh, that a lot of the institutions that have made these very substantial changes um, are, are going to materially sort of depart from that. Questions? Um, in the back there? Anna? Stuart Brown with Warren Capital. I have a question about the cast of characters making decisions. Given this fellow's propensity to nominate uh, a fox for each hen house, how <laughs> significant might it be to have a couple of Rand Pauls at the Fed? <laughs> Don. <laughs> so I'm not exactly sure what what that means in terms of monetary <laughs> policy. I would say the Fed has a legislative mandate. It has certain instruments that it uses to meet that legislative mandate. There can be disagreements about whether it's used them appropriately, uh, how to do it, et cetera. And I would think anybody that joined the Board of Governors without a change in the legislative mandate, Section 2A of the Federal Reserve Act, having to do with maximum employment and stable prices, would say their job, they, when they take that oath of office, their job is to use the instruments available to the Fed to hit the goals that Congress has given them. So uh, I think there are constraints on what someone could do. Now, people could come in and disagree about how to hit those goals, and good health, and there are people already sitting around that table who disagree on how to hit those goals. But I don't, I don't, I don't, I think the basic framework should, should remain in place. That shouldn't be sensitive. This is important for democratic accountability when the law says what you're supposed to do, the law gives you certain instruments to do it with, you ought to be trying to do it. And I think that constraint, sort of rule of law constraint, uh, would be a constraint on anyone who was appointed to the Board of Governors. Lenny Wolf with Johns Hopkins. Question for Governor Brainerd. Regardless of the structure of a fiscal stimulus package, does monetization of an increased federal deficit 
enter into your thinking on interest rate policy? Um, I, I think that um, the way that I laid it out earlier is really the way uh, I think about it, which is um, fiscal policy um, uh, could be uh, an important uh, additional source of uncertainty uh, to the outlook and that monetary policy would simply, uh, you know, it's very clearly oriented to its dual mandate. Um, and so, you know, the, the complexity is taking into account uncertainty because of the forward-looking nature. Um, but uh, given that, um, that monetary policy would essentially um, react to uh, whatever the set of changes is depending on, um, again, the magnitude, the timing, the extent to which it boosted um, the longer-run neutral rate by uh, raising the supply side of the economy as opposed to uh, more, more, more predominantly focusing on, on aggregate demand. Um, those are the ways, I think, that monetary policy uh, would uh, take into account potential changes. Yeah, you don't worry. High debt to GDP ratio, that makes you a little bit more constrained about worrying about raising rates. Done. <laughs> I don't, no, you no. shouldn't. I mean, uh, I guess I would repeat the answer to my previous question. You're, you've got goals, mm -hmm. and you've got, a, you've got to meet them. That's it. And if the Congress has, put, has embedded a high debt-to-GDP ratio that's reflected in a higher equilibrium interest rate, a higher level of interest rates, so be it. That's mm -hmm. what's, that's what's going to happen. That'll crowd out certain kinds of domestic spending. Among other things, it will crowd out exports and crowd in imports because it would tend to strengthen the dollar. Um, it also might tend to crowd out investment and interest-sensitive, uh, say, housing, interest-sensitive household spending. Uh, but that would be really, for, in some sense, for the Congress to take account of when it, when it increased the level of the debt. In the back. Pablo Villanueva, Rocos Capital. In the past, Governor Brainerd, you've mentioned the increase of this gig economy, the increase of temporary workers, contractors, Uber drivers being like the poster child. Is this a structural change in the, in your view, is this structural change in the way people look at labor markets? Or is it a problem that shows that there's some slack remaining and that the monetary policy should address it? Yeah, so um, I, I actually um, uh, have been giving some uh, thought to this question. Um, the gig economy, as you know, uh, narrowly speaking, uh, jobs that are enabled by new technology platforms in a very narrow sense is really tiny, but growing rapidly. But the much larger um, uh, sense uh, in which the uh, structure of the labor force is changing is if you include... Um, contract workers and uh, temporary workers, then you get to closer to 15% of the economy. And you've seen an expansion, as Alan Kruger uh, and Larry Katz have done in some really nice work, you've seen an expansion from 10 to 15% in a very short period of time. And um, understanding exactly uh, what uh, is uh, the implications of that, I think we're in extremely early stages of understanding. Does that uh, potentially account for some of the elevated, is it a structurally elevated number of workers that are working part-time who prefer full-time? I don't think we know enough yet. We're just beginning to get some uh, sense because uh, the BLS had discontinued their contingent worker survey. And so you know, hopefully we'll get some insights uh, once they uh, rerun that um, uh, you know, again. Um, right now we're dependent a bit on the, the kind of uh, uh, Alan Kruger and Larry Katz work. Um, similarly, I think there's a whole set of issues that really don't go to um, understanding employment um, and you know what underlies the uh, slack, but goes to um, social security and uh, social insurance and you know are the kinds of uh, workers that are employed in um, contract positions less likely, for instance, to have retirement benefits or health benefits or be able to invest in their career. Uh, uh, so there's a whole set of issues there that we um, really don't get into from the perspective of monetary policy, but really do matter a, a great deal um, from the broader um, uh, uh, perspective of the resilience of the, of the U.S. economy overall. Great. Anything to add? 
Nope. Okay, I think we'll make that our last question. Please thank you so much in thanking both Governor Brainerd and Governor Cohn. Thank you.